welcome to Checking In with Amy. My name is Amy Goldberg and I'm a registered nurse with the Elder Service Plan of the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. The Elder Service Plan is a program to keep people living in their home healthy, independent, and actively. We service the communities of East Boston, Chelsea, Revere, Winthrop, Everett, Malden, Medford, Melrose, Stoneham, and Boston's North End. Today I'm delighted, as my guest, to have Dr. Diana Iandolo, who is an optometrist with the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. So welcome, Diana. Thank you. And so now my first question, of course, would be, what is the difference mm -hmm. between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist? Mm -hmm. An optometrist is primary eye care and we do not do surgery. Surgery would be done by the ophthalmologist who are the specialists. So similar to your primary care doctor would refer you to a cardiologist if there was a problem with your heart. Right. An optometrist would send you to an ophthalmologist if there was a problem with a specific part of your eye. Okay, so good to know. Mm -hmm. Now we're off to a start All that right, we know good. we were at. Yep. <laughs> so We've got three very important topics. Mm -hmm. The first one today that I think a lot of people would like to know about mm -hmm. is glaucoma. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit, talk me through what is it. Mm -hmm. So the first slide that we have is a picture of the eye. And this is a picture as if you cut the eye in half. So the circle is around the optic nerve, which is way in the back of the eye. The optic nerve connects the eye to the brain. This sends all the information back and forth. Usually with most glaucomas, the pressure inside the eye is high. That pressure causes damage to that nerve. And the nerve is kind of like the cord that plugs your TV into the wall. If there's damage to that cord, the quality of your picture on your TV is not going to be as good. Right. Similarly here, if there's damage to that cord, the signal can't get to your brain, you're not going to see well. That's permanent vision loss. Mm -hmm. And most times it's because the pressure inside the eye is high. So what are the risk factors for glaucoma? Mm -hmm. So. Age is a risk factor for glaucoma. As we get older, our ability to regulate the pressure system inside our eye doesn't work as well as it used to. Certain races, uh, African American and Hispanics, are more at risk for developing glaucoma. And then there is a genetic component. So if you have a family history of glaucoma, then you should make sure that you're screened for um, glaucoma. Siblings are the highest risk factor, so particularly if you have a sibling who has glaucoma, you're more at risk. Wow, mm -hmm. okay. And what would be the warning signs mm -hmm. that someone should pay attention to? Mm -hmm. So glaucoma is one of the main reasons that we request routine eye exams every couple of years because there are no warning signs with glaucoma mm. until it's way too late. The pressure inside the eye can be high and you have no pain or sensation of it. Similar to if you have high blood pressure, right. most times you might not know until you go to the doctors and, and they, they check the reading. When it's very severe and past the point of improving vision, then you might have some signs of decreased vision. But we want to get you uh, way before that starting treatment. Well, there's no warning signs, so mm -hmm. that's a little scary. Mm -hmm. So what would things look like if you had glaucoma? Mm -hmm. What would a patient possibly see mm -hmm. when they looked out? So this next picture shows if you had severe glaucoma that already had permanent vision loss. It affects your side vision. This is the vision that allows you to walk around a room without bumping into things. Your central vision usually remains clear, so it's like a tunnel vision. Right. You would still be able to read and write, but your side vision would be black. Mm -hmm. So people probably, we talked about this a little bit, they might need to look up or down or you know, move their head a little bit more. So that with, um, there are ways of, of training you to see if you have permanent vision loss from glaucoma, but if you were legally blind from glaucoma, most likely you would be taught to walk with a white cane right. to help you maneuver your environment. 
there are other techniques when we get to macular degeneration right, to that we help can discuss. us see better. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how would you diagnose this? So on a routine eye exam, uh, your eye pressure is, is checked, similar to every time you go to the doctors, they check your blood pressure. So we check the eye pressure a couple ways, and one which is commonly known as the ear puff test, and a lot of people are a little hesitant for the ear puff test because it does uh, send a burst of ear towards your eye, and sometimes that makes people a little anxious. But when it sends the burst of ear to the eye, the, uh, how quickly the ear returns tells us what the pressure reading is inside the eye. The other way we check it is with the blue light test. Mm. We put an eye drop in the eye, which is yellow, and it numbs the eye, and we use a blue light and a little probe to touch the front of the eye, and the pressure that is inside the eye pushing back gives us a number. This is a screening for glaucoma, so if the number is high, then we know that we have to do more investigation to see mm. if that's too high for the nerve, if it's causing any damage. Okay, so now, I've got glaucoma, mm -hmm. we'll say, mm -hmm. and what kind of a treatment mm -hmm. would we do for this? So we aim to lower the pressure inside the eye, right. so it's nice and gentle up against the optic nerve, it's not causing any damage. Most of the times we can achieve this by using one eye drop before we go to bed, it controls the pressure and it prevents permanent vision loss. We want to catch it as soon as possible. When damage has been done to the nerve, we cannot reverse it. Mm -hmm. So we want to start treatment before we see signs of damage that can impact your vision. And that comes back to having routine eye exams to try to catch this as soon as possible. This is huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, there are no warning signs. Yep. And then, you yeah, know. Yeah, we need to, to treat it. Quickly. Quick, as, as, soon, as, as soon as we wow. find it. Mm -hmm. so, so if you have the, the risk factors, wow you should be having routine eye exams. And if you don't have any risk factors, people of any age should be having eye exams at a max every two years. Right. Well, when they finish listening to this show. Yeah, everyone's gonna be on the phone. Yeah. They're gonna be <laughs> very busy going. Which is good. So the next topic that we're going to discuss is cataracts. Mm -hmm. And what exactly is a cataract? Mm -hmm. So people confuse cataracts and glaucoma frequently. Glaucoma is an eye disease. Not everybody will develop glaucoma, thankfully. Cataracts are a normal part of aging. So if you live long enough, everybody will develop cataracts. So if we go back to our picture of the eye, the arrow is pointing towards the lens. So you can see this is more towards the front of the eye. That lens is like a window. And when we're born, it's brand new, nice and clear. We can see through it perfectly. As we get older, the lens becomes more cloudy or dirty, and when we have a cloudy window to look through, it's harder for us to see. So with age and time, it just gets more difficult for you to see through that, and that's what we call a cataract. And so let's talk about the causes of cataracts. So primarily the, causes, the cause of cataract is, is age. Can't do anything about that. As right. we get older, this develops. There are certain things that can make cataracts progress more quickly. One is diabetes. People with diabetes tend to have cataracts sooner than people who don't have diabetes. Certain medications such as steroids can also uh, progress cataracts more quickly. And then the bad rays of the sun, UV, UV light, can also quicken the process of cataracts. So wearing sunglasses is important to protect the eyes. And they look cool, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Get right sunglasses. Nice yeah. <laughs> now, how things, um, how things might look mm -hmm. if you had a cataract. Mm -hmm. We have pictures of that. So on the left is a nice, clear, in-focus picture, and on the right is a hazy, blurry picture. So this is similar to what you would see if you had say an old pair of glasses or a prescription that needed to be updated. So a lot of people come in for eye exams saying they need their glasses updated because they can't see well. When in reality it's their cataracts are causing this blurry vision. So we know that the cataract develops inside the eye. So no matter what lens or glasses you put on in front, it's not gonna allow you to see through that dirty right. window any clearer. So a lot of people have a hard time understanding why stronger glasses just won't fix it, but the problem's inside with, with that lens. 
Also, um, you can have changes in your perception of color, so things might not seem as vibrant and um, contrast might not be as, as clear with, with cataracts. Mm. It all sounds great, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. So how can I prevent it? So you can't prevent cataracts, but you can slow the progression of cataracts. And one is how we talked about wearing sunglasses. Right. Um, they are doing research to see if diets or different types of um, supplements might slow the progression of cataracts. But for now, it's having a healthy lifestyle and, and protecting your eyes from the sun. Okay, mm -hmm. we can do that. Mm -hmm. And how would you diagnose it? So we diagnose cataracts uh, on a routine eye exam by physically looking at the cataract, and then we grade how cloudy it is to see how much it's impacting your vision. So on any routine eye exam, we'll be able to diagnose cataracts if you have them. Okay, mm -hmm. and now I've got them, we'll pretend. Yep. And how are you gonna treat them? Mm -hmm. how, what kind of a treatment do you do? So the only treatment for cataracts at this point is surgery. And basically what we do is we replace the window with a brand new clear one. So if you look at this picture, the, um, uh, the before picture with the arrow has the cataract and clearly that lens is cloudy. If you had to look through a window that cloudy, you would not see well. Right. After surgery, you can see it's perfectly clear. That patient likely has very good vision after surgery. And if we go to um, the slide before, I think, there's a, a picture of where we actually do cataract surgery. So the, we see the arrow where it's pointing towards the lens. That's the, the, the cataract that needs to be removed. And what we do is we make a little incision in your cornea, which is the clear part that covers the colored part, your iris and they're able to make a very small incision and they go inside and they break up the cataract. It's kind of like a little jackhammer but it uses ultrasound and then they suck out the little pieces and they're able to implant a new clear plastic lens in the same spot where your previous lens was. Surgery is very simple nowadays. It's an outpatient procedure. You're not under general anesthesia. They do give you something that makes you a little sleepy and has a little bit of pain medication in it, but the surgery itself is usually about a half an hour. After surgery, you go home with a patch over your eye. They only do one eye at a time. And the, you have multiple eye drops after surgery, which all have a different schedule that you have to use the eye drops for. So that's probably the most important part of considering cataract surgery. You have to be able to keep track of your schedule of drops and right. be able to administer your drops. So if you're not able to do that yourself, you wanna have a support system in place before you have surgery to make sure you can do that. If you take your drops correctly, the rate of complications nowadays is, is very low. Most people do very well after cataract surgery. That's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. So. A lot of people after they have cataract surgery say, why did I wait so long? Right. I wish I did it sooner. Because everything's so much clearer. Exactly, and... exactly. Mm -hmm. So the last topic is mm -hmm. macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't know a lot about this mm -hmm. before you and I mm -hmm. met. So let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. This is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. This is a scary one for patients. So this takes away your fine detail vision. It takes away your vision that allows you to do the things you want to do. Read, write, hobbies, things like that. So it's very scary to people. What happens with macular degeneration? So if we look at another picture of the eye, the arrow is pointing towards the part of the eye that's affected. That's called your macula. It's a relatively small part of the eye, but it's one of the most important. So there are cells inside of our eye that regenerate. And the old cell it needs to be removed from the eye. It's kind of like trash once it's done working. And then a new one regenerates. Well, that trash has its own system for being removed. When we have macular degeneration, that system does not work as well, so we end up getting a buildup of trash inside of our eye, and that's toxic to the eye, and it causes permanent damage. So mm. that's the basis of what's going on behind macular degeneration. And what are the risk factors for that disease? So 
age is another one. So okay. as we get older, our eye doesn't function as well as it, as it used to. So that trash removal system has a harder time than it did when, when we were younger. Caucasians and females are more at risk for developing macular degeneration. And this also has a genetic component. So if you have a family history of it, you're more likely to develop macular degeneration. Another big risk factor is smoking. Smoking is the one risk factor mm. that we can modify. Right. So if we have it in our family, we can't do anything about that. But we can do something about smoking. So sometimes it's hard to get across to patients that you're young now, you can see well, but you're smoking. So I try to convey that you might be doing harm to your vision when you're older. When we're older, we may be less mobile, less physically active, and we may want to be more visually active, doing things that we like to do, right. reading and writing. And we might not be able to do that later in life because of decisions we made when we were younger. So smoking is, an, is one that we can try to improve upon right. to decrease our risk. Well, the age I've got, the female I've got, yeah. the Caucasian I've yeah. got, yeah. but I never smoked. Good. And there was no family history. So that's great. So those two. Yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll take those. It's we'll not take good. those. So, um, how, how would things look if I had macular degeneration and I was looking mm -hmm. out at something? So, the first picture here shows a, a, a normal vision. The second picture shows some blurring of part of the face. The third picture shows some distortion or waviness. So you can have blurry vision, but particularly with macular degeneration, you can get a crooked or wavy appearance of things, so distortion. Mm. The last picture shows when it's more advanced and we've had permanent damage and permanent vision loss. So we basically have a, a black spot um, which is basically dead tissue, dead retina in our eye that is not functioning anymore. Mm. So when you're looking straight ahead at something, you're not able to see that spot. You see, a, you see a black spot. So if you can imagine every little thing that you're looking directly at, you would not see. Mm. So a lot of people get nervous with macular degeneration that they're going to be blind. There's different levels of blindness. So with macular degeneration, you'll never be blind in the sense that it will be totally dark, lights out. Right. It does have a major impact on your vision, but your side vision will never be affected. So you'll always be able to walk around and not bump into things, but right. that central vision will be, will be affected. And that's when you would just move your head a certain way? Yeah, so there's ways of, if you have macular degeneration, and now when you look at something, you, you see this black spot. Right there's still ways of you doing the things you want to do like reading so we can train you to say look above what you are looking right. at so now you can use a healthy part of your eye to see that word that you want to read so just because we have macular degeneration and there has been some vision loss doesn't mean we still can't do the things that we want to do right yeah and how can we prevent it so one of the things that we have our patients do is sometimes we'll give them a grid and when we look at a grid you want to cover one eye at a time if you don't cover one eye you, the good eye could make up for the bad eye and you won't notice that there's actually a problem in one of your eyes your brain's very good at adapting so you cover one eye and if you look at something that has straight lines you can notice if there's some distortion or waviness you do this right. with both eyes so one of the things that we want you to do is to pay attention to your vision so as soon as you see a change, you start noticing that something's crooked, you call us as soon as possible mm -hmm. so that we can see if treatment is needed and give it as quickly as possible. If you don't have a grid, everybody can do this at home with something that they see every day, maybe a clock in their kitchen or your calendar. Cover one eye, take a look, cover the other eye. Your two eyes will not see the same, but we're looking for distortion. Okay. And if you see that, you should have an eye exam and sooner than later. So you want to pick up the phone that day or the next day and call and say, right. this is what I'm experiencing. When do you recommend that I come in? There are other things that we can do in our daily lives to lower our risk of developing macular degeneration. 
Um, the first one on the list here is, is eye examination. So routine eye exams, again, are very important every two years if you're not having any problems. And then once we get to 60 or so, we should be having eye exams every year because our risk of uh, developing disease increases as we get older. Basically, a good healthy diet is it's good for your body and it's good for your eye too. Right. Particularly for macular degeneration, green leafy vegetables are really good for that part of the eye, kale, spinach, um, antioxidants are good for that part of the eye. Again, the not smoking, which we talked about, right. and also wearing sunglasses. So there has been some studies that show that the UV rays of the sun also damage this part of the eye. So it's good to wear sunglasses year round, especially here. Right. So when there's snow on the ground, the UV rays can bounce off the snow and then back into your eye. So it's a good habit to get into year round wearing the sunglasses. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is there any treatment for macular degeneration? So there's a lot of research being done with macular degeneration, especially as the population is aging. This is becoming more prevalent. So within the last 20 years, even 10 years, new treatments are becoming available. One of the treatments we use are uh, supplements. These supplements you can find in the pharmacy. So a lot of people will notice that there are vitamins and supplements that are targeted for the eye. They'll say, oh, I saw this, it said for eye health, I started taking it. This has been shown to be effective in patients with moderate to severe macular degeneration, and there are high dose vitamins specific for people with the disease. Right. So these are not vitamins that everybody should be taking. So if you are thinking about taking a supplement that says for the eye, I would consult with your eye care provider first because these are not meant for everybody. But people with macular degeneration, there is uh, the supplements so we can recommend those for patients. There's more treatments available now that involve administering medication directly into the eye and they do that by putting a needle inside your eye. So it sounds terrifying. And most of my patients, I've, I've never had it done, but most of my patients have told me that it's not as bad as it sounds. So a lot of people are scared of the treatment because, oh, you're gonna put a needle in my eye, that sounds terrible. So I, I would say that the, the most common uh, comment is that, oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought. Okay. These medications are improving as each year goes by. So at first, they were able to stop the vision from getting worse. They couldn't make it better, but at least we could halt the progression at that moment. Now we're getting to the point where we can actually start to see some improvements in the vision okay. with the medication. And we're finding that the sooner we can administer this medication, the better off the vision is. So that's where that prevention comes in, routine eye exams, and monitoring your vision. And if you see anything different, uh, you give us a call and we'll tell you when to come in and, and we'll take a look. That's great. That's a lot of information. Mm -hmm. So first of all, thank you. You're welcome. For being my guest today. And just to let everyone know that um, having you back again for the next month mm -hmm. to talk about a little bit more about the eye mm -hmm. because we really didn't have enough time okay. to do it all in one session. Great, so sounds good. love to have you back. Okay, great. So what I would like to do is to just close by saying if you or anyone that you know needs help, and more information about the Elder Service Plan, um, please feel free to give us a call at 617-568-6377. We will send you out information in this checking in with Amy bag. And our eye clinic at the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center is available for anyone that needs an eye exam. And until we see each other again, please stay well. Thank you. Bye now.
My parents were always very independent. They always seemed to take care of each other. My dad met my mom when she was 13 and he was 15, so they got a lot of practice. It was really difficult when they were faced with health challenges and started to need some help. It, it was also really hard on me and my brothers. It seemed like uh, every day we were getting calls. They need to go to this appointment or that appointment. And it became pretty apparent that they you know, really couldn't live on their own without some help, and more importantly, stay healthy. We're lucky to find the Elder Service Plan. Uh, almost immediately after enrolling, uh, we saw some real change for the positive. Uh, all their medical appointments were in the same location, including the prescriptions. Uh, if they did need to go to a, see a specialist, then transportation would take them, and that was a big relief for us. Uh, my mom attended the Pace Day Center each day where she could really socialize, and she loved that. Uh, when they needed services in the home, that was a big help too. Uh, and my dad, you know, he'd still call me every day, but uh, not because he had to, because he wanted to. He'd say, Stevie, you know, you won't believe it, they fixed my teeth, uh, they got me some new shoes today. Uh, it just brought some amazing stability to the family. I'll see you a little later today, okay? okay. My name's Lucas Akerley. I'm the activities coordinator for the Elder Service Plan in Winthrop. Today we're doing active parachute games. We uh, have a ball toss with some music. It's fun. Keeping active at ESP is part of our plan to keep you happy, healthy, and independent. Our mission at the Elder Service Plan is to keep our participants living safely in the community. And we do that in a number of ways. The first being with the physician and the entire team to take care of the person medically. We also try to think creatively and provide other things that they may need, be it shopping service, laundry service, we may provide respite for um, the caregiver, or even aid visits in our supported housing. We try to be as flexible as possible here in the Elder Service Plan to reach the goal of keeping our participants living safely in the community. My name is um, Patty Ferranti and um, I'm with the Elder Service Care Program and I absolutely love it. Just talking about it right now makes me want to cry. Before I was in the ESP, I was always calling my family and having them, you know, pick me up to take me to doctor's appointments and stuff like that. And now I, you know, now that I'm in ESP, I have the door-to-door um, -door service, coordinated care. My doctor always knows I'm coming. They always arrange my appointments. Everything is just so perfect. The program is fantastic, it really is. when you do that. As a physical therapist in the Elder Service Plan, a big part of my job is to help people keep up with their strength and balance. Um, a lot of times I see people after they get injured or some type of surgery, but a, another part of my job is to make sure people stay active with the regular exercise program so they don't lose the strength and balance they gain back. What we do is we talk to the person to find out what they want. Do they want to increase their endurance, their strength? Do they want to be able to do things easier throughout the course of their day? We will work with them and develop a plan and we move forward with it. We try really hard to keep up with the mission of the program, which is to keep people in the community of their choosing for as long as possible and as safe as possible. Even sometimes just a cane or a walker can make all the difference in making sure people stay safe. Very central to our plan and what we do here is the patient, the person. And uh, the way we deliver that care is by having a care plan which centers around a person's goals, their choices. As the medical director for the Yellow Service Plan for the last 25 years, uh, I've had the pleasure of watching our program grow enormously. While we started out largely in East Boston, we now serve participants in Chelsea, Revere, Everett, East Boston, and Winthrop. I think one of the real great reasons for our success is our ability to uh, comprehensively coordinate our participants' needs. It's not just seeing the doctor or the nurse. Pharmacists, activities directors, nurses, nurse practitioners, van drivers, dietitians, all of us work together under one roof to keep our members healthy, active, and independent.